Good afternoon and good morning, dear participants. Welcome to the Permanent Secretariat of the Community of Democracies event in solidarity with Belarus, Youth for Democratic Change. I am Daria Omishko, Associate Program Officer in Gender Equality and Youth here at the Permanent Secretariat. We're really glad today to be joined by numerous youth networks, organizations, and young leaders from across the world to express solidarity and support to the aspirations for freedom and democracy of Belarusian people who have been peacefully protesting for six months since the fraudulent presidential election. With this event, the Permanent Secretariat is joining the international community to mark the Day of Solidarity with Belarus, which is observed on February 7th. Today, we'll hear from representatives of Belarus youth to understand their hopes and plans, as well as from our COD youth leads delivering messages of support. In the meantime, please use the chat box to post questions and we'll come back to them during the Q&A session at the end of the event. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speakers from Belarus, Danila Lavretsky and Viktoria Andrukhovic. Viktoria is a human rights defender and civic activist graphic artist and designer in one person. She holds MA in political science and sociology and BA in arts and design. She is specialized in human rights and social justice, women's rights and gender equality. During her student years, she initiated and coordinated for four years a charity project dedicated to work with children from disadvantaged families and orphanages in Vilnius. In addition, she took part in political campaign, Tell the Truth, where she participated in the preparation of election campaigns and helped candidates. Before the presidential election 2020 in Belarus, Victoria was involved in work of a unified platform for online monitoring of the electoral process, Zuber. At the moment, she works at the human rights organization, Human Constanta, and International Committee for the Investigation of Torture in Belarus 2020, where she documents cases of riot, police violence, and assists also its victims. And Danila Lavretsky is youth civil activist from Minsk. He is one of the founders of Belarusian Students Association and Coalition of a Youth Candidates for Belarusian Parliament Youth Bloc. Together with his colleagues, Danila has been struggling for students' rights in Belarus. His biggest efforts are campaigns for creating student self-government in universities, also ruining monopoly of a state on youth policies and end of political repression against youth organizations and initiatives. Danila, over to you. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the audience for holding this event because it's always a pleasure to know that uh, someone abroad is uh, caring about uh, your country and that your country is an object of interest. So I've been participating in youth and civil uh, movement for five years already. And uh, during this period, I experienced myself in many different roles from a campaigner for youth rights and a negotiator with different governmental bodies to a politically arrested person in the infamous Akrestina prison and refugee uh, due to the KGB, KGB persecution. And uh, to understand Belarusian context, actually, you should uh, keep in mind that Belarus has a 200 years uh, history of uh, the fight for the rights and uh, independence of the people. Uh, since the late uh, 18th century, Belarus became the part of uh, the Russian Empire and uh, since then, Belarusian people were harshly oppressed in many different uh, ways. We've been, uh, we, we've lived through the two world wars as well as uh, communist and Nazi occupations. And uh, at the moment, we have been living under a hybrid regime and uh, dictatorship uh, for more than 26 years. Uh, but why dictatorship became uh, so strong in the country with uh, such a long history of the fight? This is a good question. And uh, simplified, the thing is uh, two factors. Uh, first one is the phenomena of the Lukashenko 
because he's a real, really charismatic and uh, cunning leader who is not afraid to use any methods to uh, keep his power. And the second factor is uh, Russia as our neighbor, who is uh, always targeting Belarus as a sphere of uh, their interest and support Lukashenko in exchange of his loyalty to uh, Russian government. Uh, the youth have always been in favor of uh, uh, democracy and uh, liberal rights and uh, uh, national interests. And uh, uh, for the last uh, 100 years, the youth was uh, the one who always uh, keep uprising and uh, hold uh, protests. And uh, my organization uh, uh, was formed back in the late of 80s. Uh, uh, 1980s, in the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, when the perestroika movement had started, and uh, uh, it was uh, free to act during this period. But uh, when the Lukashenko came to power, uh, and the regime of Lukashenko started to uh, act, uh, almost all uh, youth and independent organizations have been oppressed and banned in the public sphere. We've been operating for many years. Uh, illegally and uh, uh, we've been trying to do as many uh, cultural events and uh, different informal education as the only instruments available in this situation because any uh, person who participates in political activity is the target of uh, secret services but since uh, 2019 and 2020 uh, the politics became uh, pretty popular amongst uh, the young people and uh, uh, it became a little bit safer due to the uh, scale of uh, protests. And uh, actually, since the 1st of September, Belarusian youth and students have been protesting almost uh, each year, each day, because uh, we are sick of uh, uh, obligatory army, we are sick of uh, ideology in uh, governmental institutions, and we are sick of lack of perspectives in our own country. And despite all the repressions, uh, despite uh, uh, 15 politically imprisoned uh, students and hundreds uh, uh, who have been expelled from universities, we, are, uh, we keep fighting and uh, uh, we are really positive about the perspectives of changes in our country. So I think that everything will be okay and I'm ready to give the word to Vika. Thank you, Daniela, for this introduction. Victoria, the floor is yours now. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, uh, I would support Daniela's uh, words of gratitude, first of all. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and for, in general, supporting our uh, movement for democratic change and the enormous level of solidarity we feel right now. Thank you very much for yeah, this opportunity to, to be heard. And I think the voice of Belarusians has never been as, uh, you know, bright as it's right now. So thank you very much for all your support, for all your care about our nations. Oh, we are, could be very far geographically, maybe the situation could be different, but we're still very connected and we feel the support. And um, I would uh, start from the fact that uh, definitely Belarusian youth took very active position from the first days was the beginning of the Belarusian protest movement and a lot of young people were detained uh, as well as uh, Belarusian students were one of the most uh, probably visible protest group and the largest group that supported workers and joined the strike and for which it was repressed probably also one of the most repressed group because a lot of uh, students were expelled from university a lot of them uh, were detained there were criminal cases started against them uh, and um, actually uh, Danilo's colleague, Alana, who is a member of Coordination Council and representative for Svetlana Tsikhanovska, she, is, she was detained and she is still right now behind the bars. A lot of students and a lot of young activists, young bloggers, they are still uh, in prison. Uh, and I would say just in general figures, since I'm connected with human rights, that at the moment there are 226 recognized political prisoners. It's a uh, date, uh, it's, uh, it's a current number. And definitely among them, a lot of young people, students, also teachers, 
actually who supported the movement, who supported the student strikes, uh, a lot of women uh, and more. And um, uh, so I would also say that uh, at the moment, uh, there is, we feel that definitely protests are uh, coming down slowly, but at the same, it's not really like the com uh, the the fact that the protests becoming smaller. They're switching to a more a partisan movement. Right now, people started to unite in their uh, country yards, in their neighborhoods, and they're creating local communities uh, so that to continue their fight for democracy. And uh, yeah, again, like in our organization, there are a lot of a lot of like hundreds of volunteers, like very new to you know, the field of human rights very new to political activism and everything. It's very inspiring that, that many people actually started to be that active. And uh, this is actually, I mean, we are living in a very particular time for our nation and our nation has never been as consolidated as United as right now. And this momentum is still here. And regardless of the fact that it's already on the 7th of February, there are going to be six months on the protest movement. And unfortunately, there is not much change. But fortunately, there is still uh, this fire and people are still eager to fight for their freedom, for their, for the democracy and for their rights. Uh, so, and uh, I, what I, I would speak more about the current state of affairs. And yeah, definitely right now, uh, we are, let's say, there's more like a partisan movement. and. Unfortunately, since the protests are becoming uh, less intense, uh, the government it has more resources to invest to uh, surveillance in their social networks in the digital space, and there are a lot of attacks on uh, activists on people who are just commenting, you know, like or sharing information online, and a lot of people are uh, being detained just for um, because of, uh, I mean, not enough security of digital space and also what is peculiar probably from the recent years is the fact that our government decided to create a separate uh detention camp for the protesters so we're literally coming back to the time of the soviet union with gulags which is of course it's uh, quite uh horrifying you know like you like taking into account that we're living in the 21st century and we have a very different country and i think like again speaking about the use role and there that we are let's say use role is very particular because we are let's say we are people that grew up that we are born and grew up completely under the rule of lukashenko and we have never seen our country different and that's why our desire to have a different democratic uh state country with a democratic government that was was would support and protect their people and not attack their people is very strong and and again i want to thank very much for the international solidarity that we're feeling and i'm very grateful for all the support that is given and thank you very much i will give floor to uh daria and if there are any questions we both with Daniela are eager to answer. Thank you, Vika. Uh, thank you for your presentation and reflections on the state and plans of the democracy movement in Belarus. I think it's the time to hear from the community of democracies youth leads and then proceed with the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to also to pose the questions in the Q&A section. It's to your right. Uh, the questions will be directed to our guest speakers from Belarus. So the COD Youth Leads. COD Youth Leads are young activists and democracy leaders from different countries and world regions, from Canada to Estonia, through Nepal and Haiti. They are part of Community of Democracy social media campaign, which is called exactly like this, COD Youth Leads. It is on Twitter and Facebook. So this campaign is really aimed at sharing, engaging and inspiring stories of youth and their contributions towards defending, promoting and strengthening democracy. Make sure to read their stories on the COD website. We will leave uh, this link in the chat so you can find it. So let's start with Joanna. Joanna Dospinescu is currently the president of UN Youth Association of Romania an NGO that promotes the UN values and principles to Romanian and international youth through comprehensive actions and projects. Ioana, the floor is yours. 
What is your message to our guest speakers? Thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me properly. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be present here today. Uh, first of all, I am uh, truly impressed by the work done by both of the previous speakers. I find it truly courageous and inspiring uh, how young people are part of, um, of this movement and how they are actively fighting for the right course of action. Um, I believe that change and most importantly, change in regime is such a difficult process that can take months, years, if not decades. And as the case of Belarus shows, uh, young people play such an important role. Um, democracy is a process and is often taken for granted. Only its absence makes people appreciate its values and its importance. So I believe that faced with incredible challenges of the way young people, such as the, the ones in Belarus and in other um, similar cases, continue to work towards creating change in their communities. Um, some face, as uh, Vika has uh, told us, face threatening risk or could not benefit from basic rights or freedom. Um, in this manner, I strongly believe that every single young people should fully enjoy all human rights as per the 19th principle of the Warsaw Declaration. As it is in the, in, the, um, in the case of today's discussion, young people from each side of the world are able to share ideas and connect, um, exchange views of their contribution to the resilience of their communities, and therefore support each other. Um, we are actively proposing solutions and driving actual change in our communities that ultimately uh, leads to significant progress. One thing is certain, young people are a tremendous asset. And I believe that the young people of Belarus can actively contribute to change uh, the situation that there is um, there today. Um, what I believe, in my humble opinion, that the youth in uh, Belarus to speak is a place where human rights of very young people are met. Um, a community that can ensure that every young person is empowered to achieve their full potential uh, and their positive uh, contribution as agents of change. I will not um, speak any longer, but I would like to end my intervention with a small but impactful quote in my opinion that says the following. Uh, many small people in many small places do many small things that can alter the face of the world. In this way, I believe that we as many young people in many small places can do many small things that in the end will um, alter the face of the world positively. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to intervene here today and I wish the best of luck uh, to both of you. Thank you, Anna, for your message and to speaking about such an important point as democratic solidarity and solidarity among youth all over the world. Now, Ray, we can turn to you. Rayas Charnek is a young democracy defender from South Africa where he is pursuing his master's in international politics and aspires to one day serve his country as a diplomat. Reyes, please. Thank you so much. And allow me to uh, personally um, congratulate everyone for the work that they're doing. And um, I wish them all the best. Um, my blood will nourish the tree that will bear the fruits of freedom. Tell my people that I love them and that they must continue the fight. These are the words uttered by a young freedom fighter before he was hanged by the brutal apartheid regime. His only crime was taking on a vicious apartheid state and wanting everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, to enjoy the fruits of democracy. Solomon Mashlangu is but one of hundreds of young South Africans who understood that in order to bring societal change, it would take more than the occasional picket line. Rather, it will take the commitment that puts the niceties of youth on the back burner and often, like Solomon and many others, it would require the ultimate price. Youth activism is an imperative instrument in driving social change. The youth are the bridge between the past and the present and therefore are the bedrock in bringing about change. This is no more evident than in Belarus today. The youth are the driving force behind the change they so desperately seek. On the first day of Mr. Lukashenko's 26th year in office, thousands of students armed with nothing but their desire for a just and democratic society took to the streets, voicing their discontent. 
This has continued on for six months, and often these students have been met with violence and unlawful imprisonment. The reaction by the Lukashenko regime bears frightening parallels to that of the apartheid regime in South Africa, which would often abuse their power by unlawfully detaining activists and torturing them in hopes of scaring them into submission. This does not work in South Africa, and from our, what I hear from our speakers, it is not working in Belarus. Among the 19 principles of the Warsaw Declaration are free and fair elections, as well as the freedom of peaceful assembly and association. The Warsaw Declaration provides a roadmap to effectively establishing and functioning a functioning democracy, and the principles of a clarion call for all those who seek a just and democratic society. By the adoption of the Warsaw Declaration, states recognize the universality of democratic values. My hope is for the Warsaw Declaration to be at the center of democratization in Belarus. As in South Africa, the youth of Belarus have taken it upon themselves to be the drivers of change in their country. And just like in South Africa, they have been met with violence and unjust detainment. Just like in South Africa, freedom and democracy will not be achieved overnight and will come with much sacrifice. May the indomitable spirit of Solomon Mashangu and the youth who have sacrificed everything for South Africa's democracy guide you on your way to a just and democratic Belarus. I thank you. Thank you, Ray. Rita, I would like to hear from you. Rita Saez is the chair of the Portuguese National Youth Council. She is a young leader committed to representing and giving a strong voice to youth in its diversity. Rita, over to you. Thank you, Dalina. Can you guys hear me well? I'm having a little bit of problems with my internet. Yes? Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking Vida, Vika and Daniela for your words and for providing us a better understanding of what has happened in Belarus. The truth is there was some coverage of the situation after the elections and with the beginning of uh, the protests, but after that the world turned or the news turned into COVID more than anything else and we are lacking a lot of information about what's going on today. So it's, it was very uh, nice to actually hear from you, even though the news are not the ones that we would like as, you, as Portuguese youth. And I obviously wanted to show my support and the support of the Portuguese young people for a free democratic Belarus. And thank you for your courage and dedication to the cause and the values of democracy. We believe that the COVID-19 pandemic cannot make us turn a blind eye to human rights abuses. It cannot make us forget the Warsaw Declaration. It cannot make us forget that you are needing our help and we should cooperate and use uh, the diplomatic means as well as we can to make sure uh, to defend the democracy, liberty and the rule of law. So in every opportunity that we have at the moment in Portugal to speak with governmental officials, we are using it to bring attention to the Belarus situation and we'll continue to do so as long as it is necessary. I wish you a lot of courage and uh, we do hope that things change for the best and you can count on us, obviously. Thank you, Rita, for your message of support on behalf of Portuguese youth. And last but not least, Wilbert. Wilbert Ford is a young activist from Haiti. Since 2010, he fights for the respect of the democratic achievements. He initiates demonstrations for the respect of the rights of the students in Haiti. Wilbert, please. Hello, hello everyone, Diana. Because of the problem, the internet connection, I must close and I must turn off my camera. We can hear you well. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Hey, hello, everyone. Hello, all young people in the chat. Hey, I appreciate this initiative. Today, I am here to speak with you on two points. First, of my experience as activist in a poor country like Haiti. Secondly, to encourage you 
to protest when your right on not being respected because it is one of the way that you can make your voice here and say no to the mismanagement of the government. Young people are considered the future of the world world they call to take over. This is the reason why they must get involved at the love at all the level they have their role to play in participatory democracy. Dear young people, dear young people in the world, we are not going to give you a guy a gift. Get involved. Participate. Denounce when it does not work as expected. You are the future of the democracy. It won't be easy. It may persecute you, beat up you, beat you up, stop you. But I told you that. I am here to tell you, don't give up. Continue, even continue. have been the objective of all kind of persecution in Haiti. But me and all young people, all young activists in COD, democracy, we are there to tell, to tell you, don't stop. And we can say, In Haiti, sometimes we have been persecuted. We have been beat, we beat you sometimes, but we can say, thanks to the youngest participatory democracy have been triumphed in Haiti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Wilbert, for your message. It was... Uh breaking a little bit, but I think we understood um, what you meant to say regarding the support to the youth internationally, especially to the youth in Belarus. So now we're ready for the questions. Just a remind, please use the chat box to ask questions to our guest speakers from Belarus. We can start maybe from the youth leads. Maybe someone would like to use this opportunity and ask a question right away. If I may, Doria? Please, Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, my question, uh, let me just get it up here. Yeah, my question uh, is for either of our uh, keynote speakers. Uh, the EU and the US have been rather gingerly in the reaction to what is taking place in Belarus. Although both have officially released statements of concern, strong language has often been absent from their official rhetoric, despite the aggressive anti-Western messages uttered by Lukashenko. According to you, how should the West react? Thank you. Ika, would you like to go first? Uh, okay, I would say that uh, um, I do know, like that, the, actually, the statement of concern they are not really helpful in resolving the situation. Definitely, but there was still uh, a big support from the side of, for example, our uh, neighbor countries of European Union, such as Lithuania and Poland. Um, that actually uh, uh, provided humanitarian visas for a lot of refugees. And right now in uh, Vilnius, Warsaw, and in, in this country, there are a lot of people. So it's kind of one of the like actually practical uh, help that was provided to people of others. And I would say, but still, yeah, definitely there was, uh, there is lack in some, I would say, like common 
common response to what is actually going on and there's there were like a lot of problems how to you know uh, concerning the sanctions and they were not accepted because not all the members were supporting this but uh, i would say that there is still a support uh, from the side of uh, uh, european parliament and uh, actually like today is also going on in other solidarity than like from the side of them and uh, i would say that um there are still a lot of funds a lot of uh, ngos that are helping and, and providing funds for belarusian ngos uh grass level grassroots level activists in belarus and outside belarus so uh from my point of view so a lot of a lot has been done um and at the moment, uh, you know, like the main support that we need, it's actually like support of the grassroots activism that is the main driving force of the uh, resistance against the regime at, at the moment. Thank you. Maybe Danilo would like to add some words. Yeah, yeah, I can add some words. So I strongly, strongly believe that uh, there should be a universal mechanism of uh, condemning such autocracies. It doesn't matter if it's Belarus, China, Turkmenistan, or etc. Uh, and uh, the West and the democracy state should always uh, condemn uh, such regimes in any way possible. At the same time, I'm always I'm also in favor of any kind of sanctions because it's, it demonstrates the people inside who support the regime, especially those functioners who are still in uh, the government uh, that uh, they are minority in this world and uh, they are not right because uh, the more developed the more uh, prospective uh, states are condemning the uh, choice and uh, at the same time i also strongly believe that uh, uh, this support is important uh, for the people to see that they are not alone in the world and uh, there are similar the stories of similar states of similar periods of the history of uh, uh, other countries and uh, that uh, people uh, actually went through this uh, story i mean the other people the other nations and uh, they actually won and uh, now can uh, help other nations so i believe that uh, basically the reaction should be as uh, strong and supportive as possible but at the same time, uh, it all depends on us, because uh, any actions are more uh, effective than the words. Absolutely. Thank you, Daniela and Vika. I had actually a similar question. Maybe there are a specific steps that our other youth organizations all over the world can take to support youth in Belarus. I can continue. If it's okay. Uh, so, uh, at the moment, uh, my organization, the Russian Students Association, uh, is uh, really in favor of supporting the idea that other student unions and the youth uh, unions in uh, other countries should support the idea of sanctions against uh, Belarusian academia and Belarusian universities because uh, there is there are a lot of uh, uh, facts of violation of student rights and uh, there was a riot police in the university campus and uh, the directors and deans and uh, other academia rulers are still in power and we believe that uh, by uh, 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 cutting the co connections with uh, other universities and uh, especially international organizations who donate to those universities of ours, we will show them that they are actually being isolated. They are, they are not uh, like uh, Polish people or the Lithuanian people, they are more like uh, the Chinese or even the North Korean people uh, and it will definitely uh, influence on their minds because I uh, know and strongly believe that there are uh, still some decent people among them but uh, they not yet understand uh, how far the support of the regime uh, have gone and uh, we should really take take care of this. Thank you Daniela. Vika, would you like to add? Uh, 
if I may ask, so the question was in particular how youth organization can help, right? So I would say it will be very helpful to lobby, for example, some educational opportunities for uh, students, uh, Belarusian students who've been expelled from the universities, uh, young people who had to flee the countries, and usually like Belarusian refugees, they face very difficult conditions because they don't really have resources for living in the country. And you know, like for example, if you leave to the western, if you move to the western countries, there is a huge gap in you know let's say welfare so Belarus, and i think like daniela faced with this as well that it's pretty hard to let's say start <laughs> living in a foreign country when you just arrived and you have nothing because you had to flee urgently the country and you don't have anybody to help there and if some youth communities inside of those countries where will be able to provide any kind of uh, help to the refugees uh, in terms of uh, helping them to, let's say, uh, yeah, to settle in the country, to find an apartment, to be just a friend, at least to support, you know, because people went through quite a harsh situations. That would be very helpful, I think. And besides, probably like providing some help to other youth NGOs that are right now working and providing help to Belarusian inside and outside of the country would be also very beneficial. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vika. We have one more question in the chat from Jose Alvarado from National Democratic Institute. So Jose is asking, how have you been able to navigate the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic in your activism? May I? Thank you. Thank you if then you don't mind, because I think like it's a very good question. I really like it. Uh, I would uh, say that Belarusians should be grateful for COVID-19 in, in certain way, because it was one of the driving forces of the re uh, resistance movement, of the triggers. Uh, it started in March and uh, the response of the government was very poor. Uh, you know, like the, our president said that it's all psychosis and offered, you know, using vodka sauna and tractors to treat uh, Corona, and he, there was also very insulting and abusing uh, public policy towards people who were sick, and people started to lose their uh, loved ones, and definitely uh, volunteers took actions, and literally, like the whole society woke up at that point because they, we people needed protection. Uh, a lot of a lot of companies started to sew masks and protective costumes as well as, for example. My mom has a small sewing manufacturer and she was also sewing masks, so it's not her own, her profile. And uh, people were delivering food, uh, water, protection supplies to the hospitals and clinics. And all this, I think, like made people uh, believe that uh, we actually can make a big difference. And it's it's boost trust towards uh, NGOs or civic society, we, we get a lot of more volunteers and it's definitely the trust towards authority dropped down enormously. And and then it's actually like kind of went in parallel with the presidential campaign and with the detention that started right before the election. Uh, yeah, so challenges of COVID, I would say that actually, um, uh, speaking about this effect, Right now, the situation with COVID is pretty hard in Belarus, but still, uh, I mean, we were, let's say, using online tools uh, before COVID as well, because it's one of the most secure ways to um, be actively involved and also to stay in touch with different parts of the country, different activists, different departments, let's say. Uh, yes, so uh, I would say COVID maybe it was in certain ways helpful, in certain ways it was definitely very challenging because it was a challenge, but it's, this challenge made us stronger. This challenge uh, was one of the uh, triggers that woke up the society. And it's uh, and still it's pretty hard in terms of COVID because the numbers are falsified, something like in 15 times, actually, according to Andre Yelisev's research. So, um, Yes, but still, uh, I think it's a challenge that we kind of, right now we have more problems, I think, of the political scope. <laughs> yeah, maybe Daniela would like to add some words if he has. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I totally agree with uh, Rita, and uh, I also want to add that I was actually imprisoned for protesting against uh, holding the military parade during the pandemic back in the May 2020. And my colleague was uh, 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 and my colleague uh, was kicked out of the university for striking against uh, in favor of uh, introducing uh, of any quarantine measures in uh, her university because Belarus uh, was the only country uh, which didn't uh, introduce any quarantine measures. Uh, in the universities due to pandemic so everything uh, was uh, uh, keep uh, like it was before uh, 2020 and uh, despite all the protests people still are in favor in uh, uh, of different currency measures especially the youth who is studying in the universities because uh, uh, diner, because the death rate is pretty high and uh, numbers are falsified and people are just uh, scary of uh, what is actually happening it's uh, it's not like it was back in the april when or may when the whole world uh, including belarus and belarusian people were really scared comparing to the spirit of time well you know <laughs> because uh, time have changed and but still it is uh, in the uh, agenda of uh, the Belarusian people. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I think we have one question from Rita. Rita, would you like to ask? Yes, thank you. Well, I would like to know what as, as leaders, as just young people for the future over the next few months. and. Do you believe that increasing the international pressure um, over the institutions of Belarus would be of uh, a great difference in the sense that it would actually help changing the situation at the moment? Rita, who are you directing this question to? I would like to hear both, if that's okay. <laughs> yes, uh, Vika, would you like to go first or Danila? Okay, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I, I can see. Okay, so it's really a hard question. <laughs> and uh, there are different scenarios. Uh, I would say the more positive one and the more negative one. The more negative one is uh, that Belarus uh, will keep becoming uh, North Korea of the Europe. And uh, in the worst, worst scenario, uh, I can imagine that uh, Belarus may become uh, the integrated part of uh, Russia in some way and uh, I'm uh, not sure what exactly will people do in this situation but on the other hand the positive scenario and I think it's uh, more uh, uh, likely which is more likely to happen uh, is that uh, the protest will rise again in the spring and uh, especially among uh, young people and uh, workers uh, due to different factors and uh, also the economic situation which is very influenced influenced by the outside pressure and uh, also by internal decisions of the government which are really anti uh, economical i would say in some way uh, so uh, I believe that uh, we will see the like uh, uh, some kind of uh, outgoing of this process uh, in uh, spring, maybe somewhere around April or May, because it will show us uh, uh, which direction uh, we will go: the negative uh, possible scenario or the positive one. Thank you, Daniela. Rita, are you satisfied with the answer? Yes, I think, as Daniela was saying, it's everything can go both ways at this moment. But I would just have one more question to add, if that's okay. I would 
I would just like to ask, are you afraid of, what's, of what the future can be for you and for your own country? And how do you deal with, the, with that feeling every day? That's quite well, a difficult question, Daniela. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, in many ways, um, because uh, my colleagues are imprisoned now and uh, I'm not yet sure what uh, will happen with them. It might be three years of prison. This is a positive scenario, actually, or it might be even something worse. And uh, also, I believe that uh, in this scenario of uh, uh, Russian entry in Belarus, there might happen some kind of war, and uh, it also uh, not the best thing can happen in the life of any person. Uh, but uh, I'm still uh, willing to fight whenever it costs and uh, whenever uh, what will happen, because we don't have much uh, choice now. This is a historical moment and if you already have this process we should uh, go to the end like there is no uh, way back so yeah i'm uh, from one point of view afraid but on the other hand uh, uh, i'm also pretty confident about what i'm doing and what uh, i'm going to do in different scenarios Thank you, Daniela. I don't know if Vika wanted to add. Yeah, I wanted to add a few words. I would uh, support position on Daniela because it's very hard to speak about future regarding Belarus because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So three months, it's a lot. I don't really believe in scenario of becoming part of Russia. For me, it's pretty much impossible. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, so I, I would say that uh, it's very hard to predict, but right now it's kind of... Uh, the regime is still quite repressive and there is, there is still maybe less intense but still uh, um, resistant move again against the regime and there is like a constant let's say already stagnation like of this fight between both of them and i think there should be like some uh, sparkle or triggers that sort of you know, there could be some more actions in between and i'm not don't feel that actually people would like to go for further action in terms that it will definitely take uh, certain sacrifices. And it's, it's you know, like nobody wants to sacrifice. Um, and speaking about international pressures, whether it will help, unfortunately, I would say no, because I don't feel that our, our regime is kind of, it's, uh, you know, it's locked inside of itself. It's like a bubble. And the only pressure that could be, you know, like probably make any, you know, impact, it's pressure from the side of Russia, but Russia, uh, let's say, they definitely don't want to intervene, or at least not in the way that you probably see <laughs> speaking about, right? Um, so, yes, fears, uh, there are definitely fears, because, you know, like both with Danila, we are right now outside of our country. Unfortunately, we have our families inside, we have our friends, as Danila said, some of our colleagues and friends, they are actually in prison. And if there would be no positive change, so that means that actually they, they may spend a few years in prison, which is, uh, yeah, it's not really something positive to think about. But uh, yeah, we still hope that uh, we can make a change, we can, we can make a difference. There are still a lot of people that support the resistance movement and we and a lot of people outside of the country who had to flee and inside of the country to flee. But actually I was, was wanted to say that maybe in three months you said so there could be possibilities that you know in three months the situation was COVID if it's improved then there could be like a huge migration from from Belarus was probably migration right now is very high but it's getting more and more intense and if there will be like some uh, improvement in terms of uh, lockdown and then uh, there would be more people who would like to move out of Belarus uh, it, because it's kind of problematic to live in a country with such problems in, on a political and economic scope. Because a lot of people, they, I mean, they're already afraid to go out to the streets. So a lot of people don't have jobs. Uh, economy, a lot of companies, they relocate because of the political, because of the conditions and, and um, their economy deteriorates 
civil society is devastated. So unfortunately right now it's not really beneficial for the country, this current state, and if it will get worse, and so more people will migrate and we will, uh, yeah, lose more people. But I mean, with the majority of whom I spoke, who fled, fled the country, the majority want to come back, which is a very positive sign. So thank you for the question. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. And I have, I have one more question from Joanna. Hi. Um, I just have one quick question, which is uh, sort of related to the situation in Romania as well. Um, has the local media affected your efforts to change the current uh, situation? And if so, how did it affect it? Because, uh, for example, um, to give you a background, in Romania, even though we have a democracy, there are certain press outlets that, uh, you know, the sentiment of uh, fake news, uh, distribute fake news uh, constantly. And uh, this way uh, has given a uh, free path to an extremist uh, political party to gain 10% in the Romanian parliament, which shifted uh, the optics really to a really, really uh, nationalist uh, view. So in this way, um, do you think, or how has the local media in Belarus affected your efforts uh, to change the current situation? I may start. So, actually, uh, according to the last sociology available, the independent media are the most reliable institution in our society, and uh, they uh, played a huge role in uh, what is happening now in Belarus. And uh, at the same time, there is uh, one of the most uh, uh, beaten object uh, by the government uh, because uh, there are uh, dozens of detained uh, journalists and they've been uh, shattered and uh, kicked in uh, during the protests. But still, uh, they do their job and duty well and uh, keep covering happening in Belarus and uh, uh, in some way uh, keep uh, uh, taking the position of uh, the people in uh, many different uh, situations. At the same time, there is also a minority in the uh, face of uh, uh, governmental media, because uh, uh, you should know that uh, all the TV uh, media are controlled by the government, so we don't have any uh, TV media, uh, which is independent and uh, private. And uh, those uh, representatives of uh, TV uh, media uh, work for the government, and actually many of them uh, came from Russia, because back in August uh, uh, those workers were uh, fired for striking, uh, and uh, they were uh, changed and replaced uh, by the Russian journalists. Uh, but uh, still, as I've already mentioned, this is a minority and uh, uh, TV is not really popular in the century of the internet. And uh, all of the independent media uh, do their duty and uh, their job well. And uh, uh, I really thank them for doing this uh, work. Thank you, Danila. Vika, would you like to add something? Yeah, I would add also that actually, um, apart from COVID, one of the triggers of the, this like mass protest was also um, work of the media. And I do agree that they play like a big role, especially Telegram channels. That, you know, like actually like what uh, our authorities were planning to do on the 9th of August is the repetition of the scenario of 2010, when there was um, you know, also a massive protest that was uh, violently suppressed and it took, I mean, I don't know, less than an hour to suppress it and the internet was shut down. And at that time there was no telegram channels and the, the media was not that developed. And I mean, nobody actually uh, noticed that inside of the country, it was just like a sparkle. You know, and but in August, on August 9th, everybody, like, you know, like people, first of all, people already, you know, like started to change in VPN and, you know, like 
and everybody already have smartphones and that's in 2020. And uh, this is actually like the media coverage, proper media coverage, it's open eyes of many people and what is going on in the country. And uh, a lot of people joined, which is also um, a big move. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I would say that still media, independent media plays a very important role in coverage and very information. And I saw some in Telegram channels, they even uh, coordinate and process, coordinating protests from time to time, um, which, uh, and the protests are decentralized. So it's pretty hard, you know, like for people to manage their actions, to be honest. And the media channels, they are helping them out. And uh, speaking about state media, yes, definitely we don't, they are all, let's say, providing uh, proper propaganda. <laughs> Uh, but uh, fortunately, not many people follow in it. And as Daniela said, like it was kind of very, very um, specific situation when uh, you know, um, but there, right? Like they went on strike. The workers of but they went on strike and they were fired. And then Lukashenko actually hired uh, professionals from Russia and uh, paying them right now a normal salary. Uh, in terms of Belarus, and um, yeah, so <laughs> thank you for the question. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Daniela. Yes, the new media plays played a special role in the whole democracy movement in Belarus, as we can, saw, can see. Um, yes, as we're getting closer to the end of today's event, I would like to thank our speakers and participants for joining today's session to mark the Day of Solidarity with Belarus which is observed uh, on February 7th. Today we heard from representatives of Belarus youth to understand their hopes, plans, and also try to identify together ways how to support this democracy movement. Almost all of the speakers today mentioned the strong power of democratic and also youth solidarity. And next week, on February 9th, we'll have one more opportunity to come together, but this time for a high-level event with the involvement of democratic representatives of Belarus. We we'll look forward to hosting you for discussion just in a few days. Have a nice day and take care. Goodbye. Thank you.